Jacqueline Van de Graaff, also known as Jackie, was born on March 4, 1992, in Carrollton, Texas. The daughter of Rick and Sonja Van de Graaff, she was the youngest, having an older sister named Jenny. During her childhood, she lived in the cities of De Colony and Frisco, both in the state of Texas. Even in childhood, Jacqueline was described as a very energetic child, having the ability to practice various sports activities. At just three years old, she started in gymnastics and later participated in competitions in her state. Jacqueline was also known for her patriotic spirit. She loved to celebrate the 4th of July holiday, the United States Independence Day, in which various festivities take place across the country. She also enjoyed watching football games between the Army and Navy and watching political debates regarding the election the country's presidential. Her friends and family described her as a caring, loving, and compassionate person who loved helping others. According to friends, she made a point of encouraging them to pursue their goals and dreams, encouraging them to see their best selves and explore their talents. Her compassion also extended to animals. Jacqueline was a vegetarian throughout her life and supported the adoption of abandoned animals. She was also a religious person and a lover of literature, having J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter book series as her favorite. Jacqueline graduated in aestheticism from the Paul Mitchell School for Cosmetology. She also attended Texas Women's University for a degree in nutrition and food science. She said she chose nutrition course because of the importance that the profession has on people's general health. According to Jackie Ton, one of the closest friends, they met in high school and shared the same name, which was a tribute to Jacqueline Kennedy, wife of former U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Both started being called Jackie in high school and always hung out together. Still, according to her, Jacqueline Vandegrift made her feel authentic, in addition to entertaining her all the time. She says that her friend was a good student, focused and confident, and that she was the smartest girl she ever met. Jacqueline was 24 years old and residing in Denton, Texas, when she was the target of a brutal crime. On September 13, 2016, she went to a university bar located 800 meters from the campus where she lived. According to the official version, Jacqueline went to this bar because of a job opening that would help her stay in the city. Another version says that she went after a failed date she had through a dating app. Jacqueline even posted on her Twitter that she was happy to be at that bar. Also, according to her friend, Jacqueline was a very social person who easily made friends with people. Inside the bar, she struck up a conversation with a man named Charles Bryant. After a few hours of talking, the two left together around 9 p.m. and went to another bar nearby, where they started talking to a group of people. At 9.45 p.m., everyone decided to leave. As it was raining, Charles offered Jacqueline a lift. According to Jacqueline's friend, she accepted the ride, I should have felt comfortable in Charles' company, given all the hours they had already spent together. Along the way, they stopped at a convenience store. It was there that Jacqueline was last seen alive. The next day on September 14, just before sunrise, John Luna, captain of the police department, responded to a call regarding a terrible discovery near Lake Grapevine. In an area of dense forest next to a trail, a charred body was found inside a plastic pool. Due to the serious condition of the body, it was not possible to determine whether the victim was an adult or a child, male or female. Because of this, it took longer than usual for the coroners to identify the victim, which was later done through fingerprints. The body was that of Jacqueline Vandegrift, who was last seen the night before. The damage caused to the body made it impossible to determine the cause of death of the young woman. The only thing that was clear to the police was that this was a homicide. From that point on, the search for the person responsible for the crime began. Grapevine City Police were in charge of the case. They began investigations by retracing the young woman's steps. It was then that they discovered the victim's conversation with Charles Bryant at a bar near the campus where she lived. The police requested security camera footage of the place, which made it possible to deduce that they did not know each other before there. Inside the establishment, it was possible to see Charles introducing himself to the young woman and after talking for a while, the two leave the bar together and go to another bar. Police had access to cell phone records of the two, where it was discovered that they had spent about an hour in a nearby park after leaving the second bar. The two even went to the vicinity of Charles' residence when they left the park. With all these discoveries, 
the police decided to investigate the life of Charles Bryant. They discovered that he was already in custody for breaking a restraining order his ex-girlfriend had against him. The ex-girlfriend was Kathleen Mathis and the two dated for a few months the same year, having ended the relationship shortly before Jacqueline's death. In an interview with CBS, Kathleen Mathis said that Charles was constantly trying to win her back and that nothing would work. A few weeks before he met Jacqueline, he made regular and insistent visits to campus where his ex-girlfriend studied, which led him to being arrested three times and placed on a restraining order. According to Caitlin, Charles always gave her flowers, especially when he wanted to apologize for something. They lived about 30 kilometers away from each other, but that didn't stop him from making frequent visits to her trying to get back together. The two met at a restaurant where Caitlin worked as a waitress. She was 18 years old and had just graduated from high school. Charles was 29 years old and worked as a bartender and personal trainer. Also, according to Caitlin, she was attracted to his physique and tattoos, and that the age difference between the two didn't matter to her, but her mother didn't like that and didn't trust the boy either. The young woman's mother said that when she saw the boy for the first time, she felt a bad feeling and that she warned her daughter about him. But Caitlin said he would never hurt her and that he treated her very well. However, it only took a few weeks for the young woman to realize that her boyfriend was not what she thought. He started showing signs of manipulation and narcissism, saying things like, you never find anyone better than me. Caitlin then thought it was best to end her relationship with Charles and walk away from him, and from there, the persecution began. In interviews, Caitlin even stated that Charles wanted to do something bad to her. Despite Charles Bryant being the prime suspect in the crime, the police still had no substantial evidence against him and he was already in custody for breaking the restrictive order against him. The police decided to question him about Jacqueline and Vanda Griff. In addition to the security cameras, another thing that also made it possible to quickly identify Charles as the main suspect was the fact that he had given a business card to one of the people he had talked to at the bar together with Jacqueline. Police discovered that the same night, Charles sent several emails to his ex-girlfriend Caitlin. In one of these emails, there was a picture of a tree, followed by the text once upon a time, there was the first kiss under this tree. The photo was taken at Lake Grapevine and may even have been taken on the same day the crime occurred. When talking to Charles, the police got nothing that could help them. He denied all the accusations and claimed not to know who Jacqueline was. It was then that the police decided to call in Jim Holland, a police officer who specializes in interviewing serial criminals, who said he was able to get Charles to confess. Jim kept his promise and made Charles admit that he had been with the victim the night of the crime, but he still didn't fully admit it, saying that Jacqueline had accidentally lost her life when they had intercourse. Jim Holland thought this version was fanciful, and from the way Jacqueline was found, it was clear that it was no accident. For him, Charles took out all of the anger and frustration he had about the ex-girlfriend on the victim. From the day Jacqueline's body was found until Charles' arrest for breaking the restraining order, four days passed, enough time for him to get rid of any evidence. But when searching Charles' house, the police found several pieces of evidence of the crime, such as a military knife that probably was used that night, the victim's purse, and a bone from her in the backyard. The police also had access to videos showing Charles shopping for a show that night, something very suspicious. Also, according to the police, after the crime, Charles took the victim's cell phone and tried to add his ex with Jacqueline's Facebook account. With all the evidence the police were able to gather against Charles, he was charged with first-degree murder. In April 2018, a year and a half after the crime, the trial of Charles Bryant began. The defense alleged that Jacqueline had accidentally lost her life during an intimate relation with Charles in the park near Lake Great Flying, and that out of fear, Charles would have lost his mind and tried to hide the body instead of calling the police. He then took the young woman's body to his residence and then went to the Walmart supermarket around 4 a.m. to buy a shovel. Already with the tool, he tried to dig a hole in his backyard, but the earth was too hard, so he decided to take the young woman's body and the pool he had and took it to the park where he and the victim had gone before. The prosecution countered the defense's thesis, saying that Charles committed the crime intentionally having caused serious bodily harm using a knife in another unknown object. Caitlin, the defendant's ex-girlfriend, even testified in court, taking a stand against him. However, 
the judge ruled that jurors should not hear the story. Despite not having access to Caitlin's story, the jury found Charles Bryan guilty of the crime. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 30 years in prison. Caitlin revealed that she will always be insecure about herself and her family. She says that she fears that when Charles gets out of prison, he will do something to her or someone she loves. Experts who analyzed Charles Bryant said he has the profile of a serial criminal and that if he had not been arrested, he would likely have had more victims. This was the story of Jacqueline Van der Griff, a young dreamer who violently lost her life in a crime filled with hate and outrage. Well folks, that's it. Thank you so much for watching this far, best wishes, and I see you next time.